thank you everybody for joining us on another episode of diametric convergence uh we're back again another week another episode joined as usual by uh my pic brandon uh today we have on the show with us our friend leslie brooks she is awesome and we're gonna have a good time we're talking about uh sustainability how it affects us, uh, how we can be better at it, and what it means just basically sustainability means. So welcome, Leslie. Hey, super offended that I'm not your PIC, but whatever. Well, that's just how that goes sometimes. <laughs> I mean, if you want to like, be the third person on our show, you can, but you're, you're as the only guest as it is right now. Yeah, you can be a I was just playing. Person. Welcome. Thanks well, for having so, me, guys. <laughs> so for everybody at home, they definitely want to know who you are and what your background is and why we're talking about sustainability today. Okay. Well, um, first off, introducing me as quote-unquote friend is uh, interesting since I've known you guys both since I was 12. But, yeah, I guess I'm the friend. So um, <laughs> Sister, like <laughs> half wife, what do you want me to do? You tell me the label you need. All right, I want to be stop. I'm stop. In your label. <laughs> yeah, this is our wife. I know. I'm sorry. I'm so good at giving everybody. I'm so good at giving everybody a hard time. Okay, I'll just follow instructions. So I am Leslie. Currently, I am a fourth year PhD candidate at Rochester Institute of Technology in the. Golisano Institute for Sustainability, which is quite a mouthful. Um, so I obtained my. <laughs> What's that? It's a doctor style, so you got some. You got some knowledge. Uh, you know, try to garner some along the way. I um, I got my bachelor's. Um, I'm a Hoosier at heart, of course. Um, I got my bachelor's in environmental science at Indiana University Bloomington. And after I graduated undergrad, um, I worked to build a career in the metals recycling industry. So I actually started um, laboring in a scrapyard in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, in the dead of summer in like 116 degree heat, which is fun. Um, so I worked to learn how to identify, process, and sort metals. Um, at the same time, this 250 pound dude was doing it. And so here I am like 120 pound female in a male's industry trying to like carry all this metal and use this alligator shear and cut things and <laughs> try mm -hmm. to prove my worth, um, which is a whole other story in itself. But from there, I um, worked to become an account manager and a broker. And then um, grew to be manager of a non-Ferris uh, operations department. And then after a few years, I used my experience to develop, design, and run a metals division for a paper and plastics company, um, which was really interesting experience and very difficult. And I was only, gosh, what was I, like 25, 26 um, at the time. And so then, yeah, quick, now I'm um, present. What's up? Like, uh, real quick for those listening, uh, can you kind of just define non-ferrous? Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so metals is broken down into ferrous and non-ferrous. And ferrous means iron and non-ferrous means without iron. So non-ferrous would be your coppers, your aluminum, um, I mean, some people put stainless steel in there, but that's more of like a high temp alloy and it does have iron in it. And then, yeah, your ferrous is all of your, um, you know, iron scrap. So, right. <clears throat> so I'm curious, how did you get, you uh, right. So how did you get out to Phoenix? Like what, who, who got you out there? Did you apply to, to the job out there just to trying to do it or how did you get out there? I got me out there. <laughs> Who got me out there? I got me out there. Um, right. Right. So, well, I mean, like, I guess how, like, how did you get you out there? And 
what was the path? Did you go to four years? Sorry, you cut out there. What was that? Well, like, how did you get there? Um, what was the path? Like, did you go to four years of school and then go out there? I did. So, yeah, I got a bachelor's in environmental science. But, I mean, to be fair, I did kind of grow up in the recycling industry. Um, my mom worked for Omnisource uh, for forever. And um, so as a kid, I kind of did odd jobs around different different yards in Fort Wayne. Um, they had several locations. So kind of garnered experience doing different things for them. And I had networked um, working working through Omnisource, meeting different people. And so when I graduated, people were kind of just like waiting <laughs> to uh, use me. I don't know the right way to say that. Um, I don't want to <laughs> say it like that, but uh, it's kind of what happened. You are, uh, <laughs> Recruit, you thank you. <laughs> okay, there you go. You, yeah, John, I got, use me. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> you had, you had some kind of jobs lined up. What a, yes, what I a, did. I did. Um, so I knew a lot of people in the industry. And, you know, when I was younger, before I really got into the metals recycling industry, the scrap industry, I really, I, I firmly believed it was about reducing waste and making sure that we move materials away from landfills and into recycling facilities. And I, I really wanted to be a part of that. Um, granted, being in the industry, um, I learned that wasn't necessarily a lot of people's motivation, but we can get into that later <clears throat> um, if necessary. I don't really need to oh, bring okay. that up right now. But yeah, so I had some people that I knew that um, were interested in training me or having me train myself in a yard and learn the business. And so that's why I ended up out in Phoenix, because if you really want to know the industry, you have to start from the bottom and work your way up. So I, I was out in Phoenix. I worked in the yard. Like I said, I used all the different equipment, alligator shears, wire cutters, um, scales, just, you know, learning the business from the ground up. I did hundreds and hundreds of wire recoveries. Like I can look at a piece of insulated wire and tell you how much copper is in it um, just by looking at it. So that's cool. So yeah, that's, it, it is cool. It's not it is, very it useful is, outside the industry, but it's, 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 it's cool. Like that's, that's a cool thing to like be able to do. So, yeah. So recoveries are a big part of the recycling industry. So you taking things apart and seeing like what percentage is plastic and what percentage is iron and what percentage is aluminum and what percentage is copper. And this is basically how materials get what's known as their intrinsic value. And that's how things are priced and sold. So that's why working in a yard is really important. You take things apart, you learn what it's worth, and um, then, you know, wherever the markets are, that's how you price things. That's the short version of how that kind of works. So working in a yard and understanding that is very important. And so from there, you know, I got on the road and I just traveled the U.S. basically going to different yards and different commercial industrial accounts and seeing what they're doing with their quote unquote waste um, and, you know, things that they generate and they're not using and help them price it and move it to facilities that can recycle it. Right on. So, yeah. So, so it's been a lot of years of doing that. Um, I've, I've recycled so many, I've moved so many tons of material away from landfills. Um, it's one of the things I'm most proud of. I've, done things that people didn't think or couldn't find homes for um like tailings uh is a big one tailings are so if you do insulated copper wire uh so you've got the copper on the inside like i was telling you guys about but the like pvc and like the encasings of the wire is really really hard to recycle after it's um sent to a chopper 
So mm. for a while, I was able to find homes for that. I've even found homes for, and you guys, you guys will love this, um, adult toys. <laughs> so, oh, you know. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So, <laughs> that's, my, that's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. It's everyone's favorite. <laughs> for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I've worked for places where they had warehouses um, that they shared with adult toy distributors. So people would get those instead of what they actually ordered. So that's kind of funny. Yeah. And you'd be surprised. Like all these things have like the numbers add up on defects on anything and people can't use it and moving it, just taking it to a landfill is in my mind, just a horrible thought. You know, you've, you've put in so much, you put so much energy into making these products, just to throw them away without them getting any use. Um, so, you know, being able to recycle them is at least less painful than, you know, putting them in a landfill and not getting anything back from all that energy being used to produce them. And yeah, but so I, um, yeah, I worked in the metals recycling industry pretty much most of my life. And, and that work allowed me to basically get to where I am today. I met my current advisor, Dr. Gabrielle Galstead. Um, she is actually now Dean of, at Alfred university, but, um, through everything that I absorbed, I've been able to apply this knowledge most of my life. <laughs> right on. So I have a question. Uh, so okay. you did this for a bigger um, organization. How does people do this like for themselves? Do Are they able to recycle in their own home? And what are some things they can reuse, you know? Um, so let me think about, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the thing with recycling that's really important to understand is that depending on where you are, the capabilities of your recycling facilities vary. So for instance, like some people think that plastic bags can't be recycled because people won't take them. But the thing with plastic bags is it's not that they can't be recycled, it's that the machinery that certain facilities have, when they when plastic bags move through them, they gum up their blades and they, they shut down machines. So sorting and separation is really important and different areas and different recycling facilities can take, take in different things based off of their equipment. And um, one of the things that I, eventually wanted to get into today was something called wish cycling, um, which is something that I really, really wanted to bring up. I have been, I have been guilty of it for a while. <laughs> um, but I learned about it a few years ago and, um, it's a really, really important thing to understand. So wish cycling is, it's, it's basically what it sounds like um, is when you put anything you think can be recyclable into a recycling bin <laughs> and <laughs> you like, you want, you're like, it can be recycled. I know it can, it's got a number on it. And I'm sure like, fine, whatever. But the thing is, like I was saying earlier, you have to educate yourself on what your locale is capable of um, because if you throw in certain things in your recycling bins, it, it contaminates the other recyclables and it causes mass amounts of materials to be, to end up be redirected to landfills and you can't use it. And like, and if there's certain places, like I was saying earlier, that can't take plastic bags and you're throwing all these plastic bags into your recycling bin, they're going to throw it out. Or if you're putting stuff that hasn't been rinsed out into recycling bins, you're putting oil on stuff and things like that, like they can't use it and they have to throw it out. So it's really, really important 
if you're trying to do your job as a patron of this planet to take care of it, to understand what your area is capable of recycling. Um, So education is really, really important. What's What's that? So how people go, go about finding that information. I mean, they have to like, just go to like the city like sites or like call or Mm -hmm. just kind of, do Google searches. And isn't what's the importance of reusing things too? Like the plastic bags, for instance, you could use them for your dog or different trash cans. So see, I don't like using plastic bags for my dog. But I buy specific, like true environmentally friendly bags <laughs> for my dog waste. Um, but but I de- like instead of buying trash bags. Like if you recycle, like ninety uh, percent or more of your trash should really be recyclable. Um, so I generate maybe a plastic bag, like a grocery plastic bag of waste in two weeks, maybe. Um, but I, you know, I live alone. I don't know if I should advertise that, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like you can use them as trash bags. Like you don't need to go out and buy trash bags instead of, you know, people end up taking their trash out if they throw food into it, which I have a solution for that. In a second, I can tell you about that. But I mean, use your trash bag or use your grocery plastic bags if they, if you have to have them and you don't have reusable bags, use them as trash bags. You don't need to buy trash bags. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of things like that that you can repurpose yeah. things and use them again. So definitely. I mean, it's reduce, reuse, recycle. Yeah. So right. like I'm looking it up here and uh, there's in the, on the Fort Wayne public works site here, city of Fort Wayne uh, says they have this, this month's recycling tip. Um, ironically enough is do not recycle bags. <laughs> No plastic but your bags. grocery stores. That's funny. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, just saying. Like you know, this includes bread, like bread bags, grocery bags, newspaper bags, kitchen bags, garbage bags. Like you don't recycle those types of bags. Yeah, and that's why a lot of the grocery stores. My mom was so proud of herself the other day. She's like, I took all my my plastic bags to the grocery store. So. um uh, some grocery stores and a lot of facilities will have specifically plastic bag take-in sites, you know, because they need right. to be recycled separately. Like co-mingling is, is a term used in recycling. It means, you know, mixing lower grade. Often it means mixing lower grade stuff with higher grade stuff, but it also means like putting things that are contaminants and with things that can be easily recycled or things that aren't easily recycled that aren't necessarily contaminants and with things that can be easily recycled, like your plastic bags. So grocery stores have, have done, some have done, you know, a good job of advertising that they'll take in the bags to be recycled, but that's a separate facility or a separate process for that facility. And and even now uh, during COVID, they're still taking the bags. <laughs> well, um, they weren't um, for a while because I was doing shift, honestly, and it was breaking my heart um, because when I ordered shift, they came in with like all these plastic bags, and I'm like, um, oh. "Can I? Can I give you reusable bags? Like, can I?" do like what are there people that are take like what do i do and one person was telling me like there's some people going around like trying to collect them but right now people are just asking that you hold on to them until things quote unquote blow over i guess okay i know but, like but they are now they like it, i mean it and everything is geographic ge- geography like it depends on where you are you know that's what i'm saying like you have to people as citizens need to work to educate themselves as to what's going on in their area 
what their recycling facility. And to your question earlier, Andrew, um, yeah, you you really I can't give you a, an easy answer to that. You have to Google. You have to look up, you know, your MSW municipal solid waste, how they handle stuff. Um, you know, your your local scrap yards. Like some people, you can get money for some of your stuff. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you just you, you gotta look it up. It's like, oh, let's go look it up, and then I found I, it. But I didn't yeah, know if there's like kind of like <laughs> national like company that tracks this information or something no. that you have heard of. I just know, I just was wondering if there's some kind of resource that you're aware of that is out there for people. And I that, didn't ignore you. <laughs> <laughs> it just got overtaken by other things. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's a good example of like recycling well, and you probably know more about this than me, Leslie. But Michigan, like, you get ten cents for bringing back cans. Isn't that a great incentive? I mean, obviously people pay for it, hype, but I think it's a great way to make sure the cans get recycled. But who knows if they're going to the right places? Um. So yeah, different places have. Um you know, kind of like they're starting to do like buyback programs and things like that. And cans and um, batteries, places that do have buyback programs like that um, are some of the top recycling rates that we have. Um, you know, place things that give you money for things. Um, so like makes- California has CRV, like California redemption value. So you bring your cans in, you get money back. Um, The CRV value of things is actually usually higher than the actual, um, if you took it to a scrapyard and just asked to scrap it. Wow. So it's, there's a lot of incentive um, there, but you know, there's not incentive for everything except for like, being a good person um yeah so more programs like that to you know maybe make people pay more ahead of time i know that might not be the popular thing to say but if we did that we would definitely lose probably 90 percent of what we have and think about ways we can purpose instead of just getting more and more and more and more Right. I mean, yeah. or buy something that lasts, or you know, know how to. Well, I think that's one of the big that. things is that you know nobody's making things that last. Like everything needs to be disposable so that you can keep buying it. Like it's, uh, consumerism plays a huge part, I think, in sustainability because it's kind of yeah the, a counter effect because they, you know they need people to uh, consume. And you can't consume if you don't have to keep buying stuff over and over again. That's why they always say they never, they don't make things like they used to. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's true and it's frustrating for several, several reasons. Um, so I'm looking up something. Um, what do you think about Leslie? What do you think about uh, like vending machine recycle, like reverse vending machines? Have you looked too much like too much into those? I heard much about those. Reverse. Like people, like will bring their like reverse vending machines. Like people will bring their recyclables to a vending machine, deposit it, and like get. Oh, the like it. plastic bottles and things like that. Yeah, like your cans and plastic bottles and get money back. Yeah, I mean germ collectors. <laughs> Whatever. Sure. um they're not because it's your hand put no okay (laughs) i don't even know what to do with that um but i i don't see i haven't personally seen a lot of those i did i did see a handful of those when i was in germany um but they're very specific about yeah they're very specific about what they'll take um I mean, I think those are great. I think, I, I think agree. those are is it, a really is great thing to have in Michigan. Similar to that, like at grocery What's stores. That? Are they like the can machines at the grocery stores? 
So I no. literally don't know anything about Michigan, so you can't really <laughs> ask me that question. Right. I moved here the day before the executive stay in place order took effect, so I have no idea about anything around here where I live, and I haven't been to a grocery store yet. So if you ever have cans, <laughs> then you'll get ten cents a can, and then you Is take them to the grocery Michigan? store and scan them. And they do they have. Yeah, they do have really good recycling here, though. Like my street one day, I this is one of my favorite moments in my life. This is how obsessed I am with recycling. But um, I just had moved here and I was taking a lecture for a walk. And I had walked around the corner and it was recycling day. And like there were legit. 15 to 20 recycling bins lined up along the street. I don't know why they were all put there. I know there's like apartment complexes. I just, I don't know if that's like where they're all supposed to be, but they were all, I took a picture of it and I was like, this is recycling poor. And like, this is amazing. It's just because, because some cities do a really good job about municipal recycling and it's really nice to see. It doesn't have it. I mean, it's growing um, for sure, but you know, it's still it's still a process. So to see that many recycling bins out and to have noticed that there's way less trash bins out in this neighborhood um, is very reward, like refreshing to see um but you know again it's it's geography like you can that's why you that's why education is so important and understanding like where you live and what's going on because you know one perspective you can think that like i could think that recycling is you know up and coming it's it's everything i've wanted to be because i just saw a whole street line of recycling bins out but that's just where I am like that, like a city over, they might not even have city recycling. You know, it, it's very is dynamic to it. Is there what is it? Do you have to pay to recycle? I don't think so. Um, not where I am, um, that also is something that varies. I think what people are trying to do, though, is make it more expensive to have trash yeah, as opposed to recycling. So That's your good. your trash should cost more than your recycling. And I yeah, think I, that's one of the things that has been spreading a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's like changing those. Way, you have to pay for a service. You know, they're They're taking it away and doing what they need to do with it. At least the recycling is doing the right thing, hopefully, with it, rather than just throwing everything in the trash. Yeah. And I mean, everything has a value, too. It's just the issue with municipal recycling is a lot of it is, like, plastics. And plastics do have a value, but again, the market fluctuates. Um, But plastics are lightweight. So it takes a lot more to get the value. A lot of the value is based off of pounds or tons, not just like your can alone. Like you get 50 cents for your can or 10 cents for your can. You get 10 cents a pound, you know? So that the markets have a big influence on what gets recycled. And um, the markets are influenced by global issues. So it's it's not a easy like let me explain this all to you and this is matter of fact and finite and it's just that's just not how it works yeah. <clears throat> so which is which is i think one of the hardest parts about trying to get people to understand sustainability is that they think that there's like one solution for everything and it really depends on where you are and the resources that are there and the technology that is available and right. you know, 
where like, you are in time. Like I was, you know, last year just living on a ranch and I realized like, wow. Jealous. Yeah. <laughs> What I have is what I can use. Uh, I didn't even have transportation to and from. So basically I was just using everything that was around me and turning it into uh, different things. And, uh, I think uh, it really teaches you how to be resourceful when you do things like that. For sure. I think yeah. that everybody should have that kind of experience. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, you know, they need the opportunity as well. And some people don't know how to even do that. But I mean, you can just look at, I, I'm reluctant to bring this up because I, I don't really want to invite controversial comments, <laughs> but um, cause I'm not trying to or. make anybody mad or get into it. But like, I for lack of a better way to express um, what's happening is for the longest time I've been wanting something to happen to the world where it would just stop. <laughs> where, it would just, where it would just stop. And I just like, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> I didn't know what it would, I didn't know what it would be. Oh, um, Arthur. And unfortunately for a lot of people, no, for, unfortunately for a lot of people, you know, it's this pandemic, but like my point is a big argument with the scientific community and people outside the scientific community is if thing, if what's happening on our planet is anthropogenic, like if it's being caused by humans. And within a week, within a week of the lockdowns, within two weeks of the lockdowns, like skies are clearing up, pollution is down. People could experience like seismic activity at a whole new sensitive level because- well, How is that still a debate though? Transport, I, 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 don't get me started. Well, <laughs> because transportation- like, there's, seven, there's 7 billion people here. And all we do is just like fuck shit up, like with pollutants. Like we, that's all we do, though. Like because we don't care, because we're more concerned about making money. So we don't care what. In in order to, for the people to make the most money, they have to make things that are cheap. Cheap things are dirty, um, for the most part. For the most part, the ways, at least the way they're they're manufactured currently in in the past, um, in in the recent past, like before, you know maybe 50 or so years ago, like things were maybe a little bit more sustainable and how they were manufactured because they weren't, but it wasn't as fast. Like it wasn't as like the production wasn't as, as massive. Like when you, when you want it on a massive scale, like they have it now in order to maximize profits, it has to be like done with cheap materials and in a way that's either they're not taking any, into account anything else. So, and that's happening all over the world. So and, to like, yeah. there and like not think that all this stuff is affecting anything is complete. I don't know, either ignorance or you just are, you just don't want to acknowledge it. There, is, there it is. It's that one. <laughs> and the, and the thing, and the thing with mass production too, is that it's constant, you know? And like, that's what I'm saying. Like I wanted the world to stop. I wanted the world to see that it does matter. And like, if you look up anything right now, I mean, there's a lot of things about how shit's going to hit the fan when lockdowns are done, which they're starting to be, but, um, and they're going to make up for all the good that the lockdowns did. But, um, you know, if you look up, if you Google environmental progress or anything since, since COVID hit, like it is, insane just the things yeah. that have cleared up in just a small amount of time and that's oh, i just desperately wish people like understood this like well, we were just talking about we that are so week. responsible for this and it's it's so frustrating but yeah people people deny it all the time and um yeah. i just this is think like that a constant like, theme for us is just the power of nature um like we're always talking about this is just 
how how much it doesn't really care about humans like people want to use that as an, <laughs> as like an excuse to deny global warming they go, oh well you know n- n- mother nature is going to be here long after the humans like well yeah of course it is but what's gonna we're gonna be the ones killing ourselves <laughs> because we don't want to give any respect to what is like the powers of nature well uh, the the argument that i hear so often that annoys the crap out of me is that like well all this stuff was like gonna happen anyway and like blah blah and it's like okay climate change may be inevitable but we just like sped it up like a fuck ton like what like how like we're (laughs) there's just like you can see it so i mean at least acknowledge that we're doing it you can say that it would happen inevitably but like yeah. Right. And, and, and to your point, Andrew, yeah, that's the thing. Like I, I always wanted to get into environmentalism for the planet. And then like a while ago, I realized that I didn't need to do it for the planet because the planet has a way of naturally cleansing itself. That's what it does. And so when I realized that I was like, shit, I'm doing things for humans not to be cynical and sound like an asshole, but you know, I care about people. And, um, but so like, (laughs) um, so the thing, so when people make fun of me and call me a tree hugger or granola or a hippie and like all these things, I'm just like, I'm so sorry for caring about your well being. you know, like (laughs) you're insulting me and making fun of me for working to like prolong your life and your family's life. Like these are the things that well, I care I about. And you're, 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 you think it's funny and not worth time. And you want, I, it's just, it's just interesting to me. Like when you sit down and you think about the reality of things, like well, people who care about the environment are actually working to save human lives, not the planet. I think, uh, you know, you're right. Like you have to be a good example and, and don't let anybody like, let try to change your mind because you know, what's in your heart to be true, whether people believe you or not. But I think like what we have to remember is what we can do about it. And that is to just be a better example than other people are. Exactly. And there's like, there's, there's a difference between the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. A big thing that I wanted to bring up today is like humans are the only things in nature that follow a make take waste form of living. Like everything else, if you think about it, everything else in nature, no matter what it is, it recycles nutrients back into the earth it gives back whether it's dying or living and we just take and take and take and at the end of the day if you want to be more sustainable just think about how you can give back think about how you can consume less think about how you can waste less like do you really need do you really need that or do you want that like there are a lot of things that that we we don't really need and if you sit back and reflect on what makes you happy is that fact I, I don't know i don't have i'm trying to look around the room and think of something i don't have much because i i work really hard to be a minimalist um so i'm trying to think like is that giant tv really Oh, well, everybody who loves sports is going to be like, yeah, it is. No, um, I don't, <laughs> I'm trying to think of, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a really good example of things that are, that are necessary and not, um, I should have thought this through a little more before, but you know, when you're out and you're buying things, like, it's do you want consumer. it or do you need it? <laughs> it's the consumer's fault, right? It's not, though. It's well, not the consumer's fault, but the consumer has a responsibility. And people that supply things to the consumer are basing what they're supplying off of the consumer. So if the consumer right. wants less, then producers 
will give them things that last longer. People love purchasing the new iPhones. People love purchasing all the stuff. And like, do you know how hard it is to get like critical materials out of these electronics? Like there's like, if you think about tonnage, if you think about tonnage of waste or tonnage of how much is like thrown out to get something new, like, like a little bit of palladium or whatever is in your fancy something or other, like it might not seem like a lot, but you got to think millions and billions of people are doing the same thing. Like, so those numbers add up. So it, it like, you really, yeah, it's, it's a complex thing. People yep. have to make individual decisions to want something, <laughs> you know, it, uh, now I'm getting stressed. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't do this. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a tough Take thing. A you know, <laughs> thank you. I needed that. <laughs> yeah. You're okay. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, why don't we just go back to what exactly sustainability means? Like, I guess you talked about it for a while, but what exactly does it mean to you? So, well, okay. So, like, the official definition of sustainability is development that meets current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Okay? And so you have to – and when you think about – Sustainability is there three tiers, environmental, economic, and social. And those are really important to understand because you can't really have sustainability without focusing. Well, you can't really. You can't have it without focusing on all of those three things. And the hardest, anybody want to guess what the hardest part of all those things is to address? People? Uh, society social exactly and that's why with this whole covid thing i honestly i'm gonna get like so many hate emails if my email address is ever presented the covid thing was exciting to me in a sense that everybody had to stop and it's an opportunity for us to reassess how we're living like nobody wanted to stop nobody wanted to like change their behaviors but we have, and we did. So like, I don't want to go back to normal. I want, like, I want things to change because people have already made themselves change. So like, we should take this opportunity to build more sustainable communities because everybody thinks being sustainable is such a sacrifice. And it, and it really isn't. <laughs> but... No, I agree with you. And especially with the COVID and everything else, lockdown and uh, riots and things, it's like we all need to have some food ready that we can just uh, grow in our backyard or uh, be able to use you know, our resources around us to uh, better ourselves. Because if we weren't able to get food from the store, how would we end up getting it? We, we need to know these things. Yeah. I mean, food scarcity is definitely a big thing in the news right now. And um, I, I, when it comes to that kind of stuff, there was, um, sorry, I'm just like always eager to talk about this when I heard about it. So I was listening to some conversations about like with top chefs and people in the restaurant industry about like what the future is going to look like. And somebody was saying how they think that since restaurants, even though everybody's trying to go back to normal, quote unquote normal, um, restaurants could serve as not just like a places where people get their, like go out to eat, but as little markets because there's so much food waste because um, the restaurants weren't getting as much business. Mm -hmm. So they were talking about like actually selling their products as if they were like markets or, you know, yeah, groceries. And I think, here. what's that? 
So we had some we had some places doing that here. A couple of restaurants were selling like their inventory, just like a market. See, I, just, and I and I love that, and that's beautiful. Like that, actually, to me, like when I heard that, I was like, that's so intelligent. Like that yeah. allows for these places that already have all this stuff coming in. To- is it intelligent though, or is it greedy? Because if they have all this waste, they're just going to throw away. Why? Why would you sell it? I mean, I understand selling it now when you can't actually serve people, but why not just donate that stuff to food banks who could actually use it for good, where they're not getting enough food anyway? So I think that a lot of people. So I think that I think that donations um, is that's a very good point, but I think. What I'm referring to is long term solutions. So like restaurants and and these places have like a way of doing business where they, um, you know, have their inventory where they're expected to get this much in, expected to get this much in because they know they're going to sell this much. Right. So the the idea is like these these big farms, these big mass production farms, like they're not really logical, like because a lot of those places are wasting so much food because the, like through COVID, they can't get, they can't um, disperse this, you know, product. They can't get it to where it needs to go. But these places are receiving it. They have it. And and the idea, um, Brandon was just saying a second ago, you know, is having little farms everywhere, but okay. We don't have necessarily little farms where everybody's growing stuff, but we have places that are receiving food that could get food. And the way it's being dispersed is good because that allows social distancing. Like if more little places already have all these things and they can sell them and provide actual groceries for people, then we don't need overcrowded Kroger's and we don't need overcrowded Myers because your restaurants can provide you with the food that you already want. Right. Like, and they're already getting it. So they're, so in my mind, they're providing an already an essential, a service that's essential that we already want. And like the idea of creating local farms and, and having little community farms and having your own farms, which I love that. I think that's amazing and beautiful. And I want that for everyone. Um, but considering COVID and the restaurants and the waste that's being produced, this is an alternative that's actually pretty smart. And, um, I, I think more people should do it because it needs to be smaller and they're already getting it in, you know? So, I mean, while we work on localizing our farms and our food, like this is a, a good transition step. You know, like I never before thought of this as a transition step, but it is. It actually is a transition step. We could move from this to being more local with our food. So, because yeah. now I don't know. It's, not, it's not only a want, but a necessity. Exactly. You're turning yeah. a, a people's want for going out and not you know, going to restaurants and whatever, mm-hmm. using those facilities as a means to get your groceries without having to be in concentrated areas of people. Yeah. Yeah. And developing kind of- personal relationships. Like, you know, if you go to a restaurant all the time and you love the people, like why can't they provide you with some groceries instead of just spending $40 for two meals? Like you could actually spend $40 for like a week's worth of groceries, you know? Yeah. Yeah, out here in in Colorado and Blackhawk, they have a. Uh, my friend has a thing called Holistic Homestead, and basically, it's just a little market for a bunch of different produce and honey, and different necessities that people need. And she's doing a great thing out there. I, I'm really proud of her. I love honey. I'd love to have an apiary. <laughs> if anybody could direct me to people needing people to be like beekeepers. Please find my you're, information. You're, you're an apiarist. I mean, I just I think it's. I think it's yeah, cool. we have a few people out here. <laughs> What's that? There's a few people I know about here. Okay, so I got I should go to Colorado then. Yeah, 
ASAP. <laughs> I'm on it. I would say I'm packing up, but I don't have much to pack, so I could just get in my car. <laughs> Wonderful. I don't, I don't own anything. So. You own uh, something. So does anybody really own anything, though? <laughs> Um, Leslie, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Go um, for it. You're obviously with sustainability. You're all we're all about um, renewable energies, right? Um, have you seen or heard of Planet of the Humans? I've seen Magic for Humans. <laughs> so, so not plant, Planet of the Humans, though. <laughs> what what is it like a Netflix it's a documentary it's not it's it's a documentary um and it's put in my opinion it's garbage um because it's like a big it's like a big you know i guess middle finger to basically renewable energy but it's like trying to because it's done by it's it's very deceptive because like it was produced by michael moore and but Ugh. The issue, yeah, the issue is he's not he has like certain issues or certain things you can agree with him about, but his environmental stances are completely right wing, like all the way to the right. Uh, because the entire movie just sits there and trashes renewable energy because it does a lot yeah. of just. I think um, Michael Moore was just put there to make people make someone on that side look stupid. So right, really and documentaries you all you always have to take you always have to take with a grain of salt because their movies are made to entertain. Right. Um, right. There's so there's somebody who's writing it has an agenda. They you know they want to they want to get out a certain thing, but the whole point of this is kind of it's talking about how wasteful the renewable energy industry is because you have to buy you know it's like so because it costs so much just to get these wind turbines built and like they die after so long then all these uh, solar panels get just trashed when they die because they're no longer good they'll make better ones that last longer and with right. less resources i yeah, mean but it's like yeah the whole yeah. argument's like against like and that world because it's you know they're saying you might as well yeah well yeah but they're saying like you might as well just keep the current fossil fuel industry because it's, we're using fossil fuels the argument is we're using you know we have to use fossil fuels in order to build this, like renewable energy sources which, yeah. is, which is a ridiculous thing because huh i see what they're saying but it doesn't make sense because i feel like make things last longer and i why make it only last five years i I, I guess I would have to look in the science, but I feel like we can make a wind turbine last a hundred years. Yeah. If we want it. But like, yeah. And it's the whole thing is um, like, it's like a lot of people say is like the carbon footprint. Like there, that's a whole argument, like the carbon footprint here and there. And I know Leslie, you're not a huge fan of that term. Um, but it's the thing is they say it, but at the long end, like the long term, these renewable sources, regardless of how they're manufactured, are still less invasive or less destructive than using and burning fossil fuels. Now, there is, I do agree with the point that we don't like oil is not as scarce as they want people want to think that it is. Um, it certainly isn't a renewable resource. Like people also want to argue that it is because of the way those fuels are coming about. Like there's probably more available yeah. now than there is than what people want to think or say that there is well it's still the way not I look sustainable at, like recently. the way i look at mining oil is basically taking out um taking out the fluid in the earth's uh crust and causing more earthquakes and more problems that's right yeah that's my you on that well that's the biggest issue with like fracking like fracking is just tearing yeah. apart the earth and it's causing earthquakes and it's causing more destruction and it's like it's yeah like yeah i've been killing the planet and they're they're so like swayed on oh yeah they fill it up with other stuff it's like what are they putting into the earth right if it's filling yeah. it up other stuff what are because they're in? yeah because they're having to use like chemicals and stuff like that to do all this stuff so they have to put all this this exactly. these things that what is it 
I, I don't know. I don't know about like you know if they're even honest about what it is or if like you know I don't I like I don't I haven't looked into it so I don't actually know. But I'm sure that we even if you looked into it, you still wouldn't really know because you probably wouldn't get the whole truth. Yeah. Well, that's what needs to change is uh, transparency in any where any of our tax dollars are going. We need to have full. Yeah, for oh yeah, for sure. I mean, like everybody wants to know where their money goes. Like, I would definitely want to know where my money is going. But but then you run into like these secret programs where they can't tell you exactly. So then, what do you do? <laughs> right, about that? right. I mean, you, yeah. I mean, the other option is, well, you know, not stop paying taxes. That's when you have to like go off the grid, and then you could just start living your own sustainability. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I want to get to in this whole episode is just how to do that. Well, let's let's rewind for a second. Um, So (laughs) Michael Moore just makes me laugh um, (laughs) because I don't really know that much about him, but it has been a topic of conversation a lot with like people and like my cohort at school. (laughs) And so they filled me in and I'm glad that they have, because I don't, you know, I, I'm constantly educating myself. I, you know, it's just like a lot to take in. Um, It's very trying on your emotions when you're a very passionate person about things. Um, So I don't really want to have to see how stupid everyone is or insensitive or ignorant. So when people can just tell me about it, it's really great. So I don't have to witness it myself. But so the thing (laughs) I just had a conversation about, I didn't know the name of it about that documentary with a buddy of mine. And it's very outdated. Um, A lot of those interviews are cut off. Like the people have come out with statements saying that their their conversations have been cut off and 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 right. formed in a way to support to yeah misrepresented and formed to a way to to support whatever that documentary is about and mm-hmm. I just I'm you know I anyway um, the thing with renewable energy and non-renewable energy that you have to, that you have to look at. And this is, you know, something that I said earlier and that I, I would, I, I love revisiting is that like everything has, there's not one solution to fit all like wind energy does not work everywhere. You should not use it everywhere. It does not work. And solar energy does not work everywhere. And I understand and I've thought about this too, as someone in sustainability and as an environmentalist, like what about the process of making these, these, these um, uh, ways to harness this energy, you know, through turbines and channels and things like that. Like what energy goes into that? How is that affecting the environment? You know, and it's good to think about all those things. It is really good to think about that, but that is something that we are constantly working on is, is energy storage. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part. Like, so Andrew, you know, we, we got off track the other night, but we were having a conversation and I'm just going to revisit this because this is to me, one of the easiest ways to explain to people how, how things how things being done matters so people want to ask me questions like this a lot people say so what's better washing dishes by hand or using a dishwasher right Mm -hmm. like that's a very you know seems very simple like which one should i do well it's not very simple because it depends on how you do it if you're running your faucet constantly while trying to wash all your dishes, then a dishwasher is probably more efficient. 
And so, and then today technology is evolving. So we have way more energy efficient dishwashers. But on the other side of that, where is your energy coming from? Okay, so and like the the grid, what we call the grid, um, what your energy is made of. So you have, you know, oil and coal and natural gas and hydro non um, renewable energy like hydro. So like in New York, for example, if I if I were running my dishwasher, I could affirm that a lot of that energy is from natural gas or hydro. But if I'm in freaking Texas, like my grid is dirty as shit. So, you know, there's a difference. And and like and it also matters how long does it take your water to heat up if you need hot water. So like everything involves critical thinking, geography and what technology is available. So personally for me, I'm living in an Airbnb. I'm on the top floor. This mansion, it's like one of those Victorian mansions. It's over 100 years old. The top floor, it takes forever for the water to heat up. So as someone who's an environmentalist, that's really, really frustrating. So when I moved here, I was like, how do I, how do I adjust to this, right? Like, how do I continue to be an environmentalist when I have to run the water forever to get it warm? Okay, so this involves critical thinking. So when I take a shower, so the water heats up the fastest in the morning. So when I shower in the morning, I get hot water. Okay, once the water is already hot, it's available in the other faucets around my apartment. So after I shower, I do my dishes because the water is already warm. You know, like you have to understand like, what's happening where you are in order to make like decisions that are environmentally conscious. And like, if I need to do the dishes for some reason in the middle of the day, they cannot wait. Then what I do is I fill up like a gallon of water. Like it's, it takes more than a gallon of water, by the way, I do dishes that don't involve hot water. And then I fill up a gallon of water that I use to give my dog water while it's still warming up. So I fill this whole gallon of cool water on the hot side <laughs> in, so that I have water for my dog. And then I wash the dishes that don't need hot water. And then the, by then the hot water's kicked in and I can scrub down anything that involves hot water. So like nothing is straightforward. So it's kind of like you know, and, environmental <laughs> kung fu. Like no, right. wasted, like no wasted movements. Exactly. Like you have to like, and it, and it takes like knowing and understanding what your environment is and how you can adjust. That's the name to of what... our episode now, by the way. <laughs> Envir- kung environmental, fu. Kung, environmental kung fu. Hi-ya. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a pain. It's a pain in the ass. Like when I was prepping for this episode and then I decided to not prep for this episode because I didn't smart, want smart. to be, too, I didn't want to be too technical about anything, yeah. but I Get found, <laughs> I found, <laughs> I'm on your level. I found this <laughs> homework assignment I had to do. And, oh. um, I just like, there was part of it that I thought was super relevant to like how people feel when it comes to like dealing with being sustainable or being environmentally friendly. Like it is a chore. It can be a fucking chore to do it. And I understand that because I have like, I can only imagine someone who doesn't have a lot of knowledge in this area, but I, you know, I've spent my life trying to garner knowledge in this area. And so I'm constantly overwhelmed. I'm constantly overwhelmed. I think about everything. So you have like from, a burden of knowledge. Right. <laughs> yeah. Everything from where to live to optimal routing for errands to walking versus driving to what you're eating, where it's coming from, growing your own food and composting. And then, you take it a step further, further, 
excuse me, to deciding what goods and services to purchase based on whether the materials are recyclable or reusable and whether or not the business you are supporting incorporates eco-efficient practices. And like the amount of research that goes into this is inconvenient and it's time consuming. And I understand that. I understand that. And it's a lot. And, and I, that's why like one of the main things I wanted to get across, like through this podcast is just like, you don't need to work. Please don't try to be a sustainability expert in a day because you'll lose your freaking mind. Okay. Like it is. It is oh. awful like to get in here. Okay. Don't do that. You want to start so with small it'd just things. It would be easier if like, everybody participated so you wouldn't have to try to be so, so you wouldn't have to be as mindful because, because you would kind of be able to relax. Like, all more people are doing it. So you don't have to be as concerned about who is and who isn't. And that's another part that I put in this essay. I, I didn't even, I don't even remember writing this. I'm like really proud of this after reviewing it today but i mean being sustained so being sustainable as an individual would require a person this is what i wrote when i started this program four years ago would require a person to excommunicate themselves from society when we don't build <laughs> our communities sustainably there is no way that a single person can live sustainably in them sustainable development requires a collective response and viewing everything as connected and when you don't have that, it is really, really hard to to contribute the way you want to. So I, I, I really want to voice to people that you don't need to do everything at once. You need you need to think about like start with some things or one thing. Like for instance, don't let your kids run the water the whole time they're brushing their teeth. Like. I, I don't have kids, but I have nieces and I babysit. And that is the one thing that I see in every child. They turn the faucet on and for five minutes of them putting toothpaste on their toothbrush, it's still running before they even put the toothbrush in their mouth. Like, don't let them do that, you know, and um, don't litter and, you know, think about what you need versus what you want. And then, there are like other things that you can do, but, you know, start with one thing that you want to do. Start with one thing. And then once you put that into your daily practices, then educate yourself on something else and, and move forward. Um, you know, and by the end of it all, like you'll be able to have conversations with people in your community about how you can make your community better. And, but don't try to sit on the internet and be like, how can I be sustainable? And everything that I'm doing is wrong. And if you think of this assessment, like if I do this, but like, I'm not doing it this way, then I'm not really doing enough. Like, don't do that to yourself. Just start with something small and then branch off from there. Um, because it really is. There is a lot you can do as an individual, but it is a community effort. And in order for you to be able to support and contribute to that community effort, you have to educate yourself. And there's no better way to do that than through experience. So learning from your mistakes and learning what is the best. You can check your energy usage. You can check your water usage. You can see what works. Like there are things you can do. Um, and you don't have to think that you have to do it all. And I, I really don't want people to think that because it is so overwhelming and I've done that to myself and it's a horrifying experience and just don't do that. Just don't. So yeah, like I hope you don't even know that that's helpful. I feel like everybody always talks about sustainability and it's so intimidating and it really doesn't have to be. Yeah. Go ahead, you, I'm sorry. You, it's all good. Uh, and I agree with you on a lot of that, uh, most of it. And you can live somewhere. And most of it. You said you live in a place, Airbnb, like you can't control what windows they put in or what, uh, what type of AC unit or water heater they are using. So right, exactly. you're out of your control to a point. And I think you're right. Like if you, 
stressed out about those things, that's not the right way to go in about it. But like you said, educate, uh, educate yourself on what you can do and start there. No, that's right. a really good point, right. Brandon. Yeah, no, because exactly. Because it's like there's so many things that are out of your control. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and there's no, you know, and stress is the number one kill. Yeah. So, so the more we don't stress, think you have to do everything, more- guys. Just do what you can. And then if everybody tries to do what they can, then we can work together and do bigger things. Together. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Oh. And, you know, it does have a really important, I think it has an important part of just your well being and how you, um, how you live your life. What are you trying to say? You can, well, no, the more you can fend <laughs> for yourself, I feel like the, the, the healthier you are. Um, like, the happier you can be because you don't have to worry about like, Oh, if, if I run out of firewood, what do I do? And, and some people will know how to cut down a tree, uh, and cut down the right tree or find a tree that's already cut down. But some people will just not know what to do and freeze. So, um, you know, it gives you a sense of confidence in that sense as well. Yeah, see, I feel like we should go um, back to the system. Well, not not fully, as it's kind of half um, sarcastic. But you guys are cutting out so bad. I wonder if my interconnect internet connection is bad. Oh, maybe Brian, can you still hear me? Yeah, we're good. We're live. Yeah, we're still live. Uh, but I was saying, I don't think it's it's not totally um, like totally serious. But like, go back. Oh, like, we should back into a system of like tribalism you know what i mean like where there's people like like just like small communities hmm. what is that <laughs> that's the aliens again andrew yeah, every, man. Every, yeah. that was something that. something got me there um <laughs> all right but so like when you're in like so tribes like when people were in tribes obviously there's way too many people in the world to be able to go back into tribalism um my kind of grim view of the thing is that everybody like something bad's gonna have to happen where there's some kind of mass kill off of like lots of living things um it's inevitable it's gonna happen sooner or later because it always happens um when or how it happens is yet to be determined but i think what 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 is nice about being like tribes and is that there's people who fill certain roles right and that there's people we can go to like this person supplies us with this and they just and everybody's like happy to be in their role and then it's kind of all these like really they're self-sustaining communities um and actually and I don't, and I'm probably going to try to always bring up my book in every single show we do, just because that's awesome for me. Um, but that's kind of, um, in, in the book that I did write, it's, or am rewriting. The bloodless? That's how the people, Are you talking about the bloodless? No, no, that's the old one. It's re- oh, I'm re- I love I'm re- that I'm, re- book. I'm redoing it. I'm rewriting it. But, um, but I loved it. I'm, well, it was so good. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be better. <laughs> Uh, it's the whole point that it, and it, I didn't really make that clear in the first, I guess, go through because I wasn't really too focused on it. But on this rewrite, like the whole st- uh, position of society is that is kind of returned to tribalism where there are isolated societies that are self-sustaining like throughout the country and world because there has been all these issues where people are so far separated that they have to it's like kind of a natural thing where they get into these groups where they're of like-minded people so that they can exist in kind of these bubbles really mm-hmm. and which you know thinking about it, it's not i mean it kind of comes from somewhere so it's not too far off of, of a possible direction that we're already headed in because tribalism i mean if you, you have to look it up about tribalism and how it affecting uh, the world and society as like today um 
it just that's I, did we talk, I feel like we talked about that talked about this before about Brandon do you, yeah about tribalism um hmm, I, I don't know but I really like um the idea I haven't read any books but I've heard uh Joe Rogan talk about it quite a bit and he had yeah. someone on me about it um you know fascinating it's it's basically gives you, you know, a purpose. It gives you a sense of purpose. Maybe we talked about this in the purpose. Maybe uh, I think, I think, cause I know we talked about it. I don't know if it was on the show or if it was like between shows. I really like the idea of having a tribe, you know, but in my opinion, everyone can be our tribe. We just got to. Oh, I, I remember moral, now moral rules. Yeah. I remember now. So, I, I, obviously I've, I've mentioned this also before I've, you know, this year I've dealt with anxiety and depression pretty heavily. Um, and I'm, I know I'm not alone here. Um, so one thing that I, I looked up, I was looking at different reasons as to, you know, where anxiety comes from depression, all that. And I think I might've told you about this, but there's this Ted talk that I found about this guy who has looked into this stuff. And he said, there's a, there's a reason that it's happening to a lot of people more and more is because we have moved away because we don't have like a tribe. We don't have, because I mean, that's how humans used to exist. We were, mm. we were all, tri- we were in our tribes, but the reason that we feel this anxiety is because we have that separation from that kind of almost like yeah. a, like a, our neighbor yeah like of yeah. of our history of our ancestry where we came from there was just that whole connectedness that we had uh, and that's and we're really missing that because it just as we, we we move further and further away from it every day yeah yeah and i think that's like one of the more honestly could be like one of the more sustainable models that that are out there just it's hard to achieve because of how many people, like I said, how many people there are. But at some point, like I, th- I feel like it's going to have, it's going to be forced to make a return. Depending, well, depending you know, on I, the planet. I love native American culture and what they're all about. And I think they have a lot of great knowledge that they're always willing to share, but right. it sucks because they're so suppressed and, I'm sure they could have a lot of you know, feedback on just this episode, like how to protect our environment. They know yeah. uh, firsthand. So uh, they are the protectors. Right. So some of the last humans to like, like live that lifestyle. There are still, you know, there are tr- uh, tribes out there that have not been contacted by humans. So they're very primitive. Um, mm mm-hmm. So there are some there are still out there, but in terms of this country, yeah, you know, the Native Americans were are certainly the last of the people who can, who are still connected to that way of life. Yeah, and they say, you know, we are all one. You know, I totally believe that, and they say, you know, the Earth is also us. Right. Uh, yeah, they they say it a lot better than me, in, in different words. Uh, and I believe it all. I think um, you know, Native American history is pretty fascinating. All right. I apologize yeah. because I feel like this isn't the point of what you're trying to say, but I have a question. When you yeah. say you're redoing your book, does that mean you're just going to pretend that like the original didn't happen because I feel like you're being overcritical, which is what we all do of our own work, but I really like the original. So I don't think you should try to redo it. You could just do another one and just write it in a different language of how you want to present it. Don't redo it. It's the same basic story, but it'll be much more fleshed out. Um, I, like I, kind of I don't, agree with I don't think this. there was anything wrong with it. I don't. I don't understand. Like when you say redo it, I'm just like, why? Why? Well, just you, more. When you write like, then you sign off on it. You can make a part two or make go deeper into it. Maybe. I don't because. Or is it a marketing thing? <laughs> no, it's definitely not a marketing thing. No, um, I'm, 
it's for just us. for my own my own like um satisfaction basically because i just don't feel like it's like it's good enough because i wrote like one pass at it's it it's not about you it's about it your audience about my, my story this is about me <laughs> <laughs> everyone wants to say it's playing, about man. it is about me that's you know i won't no i'm just playing it's my, my passion so i have to defend myself um but i just okay. like there's it's very because there's because I got like feedback on it and some criticisms, like constructive criticism. There's just not it, the level of character development just isn't present that I would like it to be. I'd like it there to be way more character development. And I didn't really plan out that part of the story. I kind of just winged most of that. So this time going through it, it's going to be the same basic story. Reusing a lot of the whole, a lot of the original stuff. Like I'm not rewriting the entire thing. I'm reusing a lot of stuff, but I'm just uh, re is kind that, of re or reorganizing it. Is that something uh, authors do, like on different editions? Is Isn't that, that like what a CD does occasionally, like remastered? Are you going to call yeah. it the Bloodless Remastered? <laughs> Well, the title's title going to be different because a Budless is down. a stupid, stupid title. I don't stop it. It's it doesn't not. make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. I I get it. <laughs> you're too close to it. I'm not. You're too, I'm really far you're, away. you're too close to the author. Yeah, about, I'm so. Nope. I'm like thousands of miles away at any given time. Right. Right. To, too close to the author. <laughs> <laughs> um so so there's just yeah there's just a lot of things that i could do better um because i like i said i didn't really plan it out i just kind of winged the entire story which i is irresponsible when you're writing the story so there's not there's not really any narrative um there's no real point to the story it's just kind of things happening well a lot of people didn't I'm, I'm not saying it was all bad like there's i a lot of people who read it said they really liked it. Like there's plenty of good praise for it. I just think it could be tighter. And just yeah. More, for sure, man. Better constructed, I think. I I make a point to not go through and reread anything I write because I'll just tear it apart. So yeah, I, 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 I get it. Especially if it's a published book. I don't I don't re I try not to reread my published papers a lot because I'm just like, no. Why? <laughs> yeah. Let you know, me change just, it. I just because I just, I don't know I because I was planning on writing more stories when I and I was I was creating these additional works and um, they like the sequels to it. I just realized how like I I'm kind of having to re gonna have to rewrite it for it to match these other things because I I fleshed out the story a little bit more in the overall arc. Uh, cause it's all going to be all connected, but spanned across multiple generations and like a long, like a very long time period. So when should we anticipate this new book arriving, Andrew? Oh, don't anticipate anything. <laughs> 20, 20, 20, I don't know. Oh, I don't intend to live that long, but cool. I'm excited for you. You'll be you'll be in your thirties still. Hush it. You're you're healthy. Why why would that be? <laughs> Get into it. <laughs> I'm not doing this right now. <laughs> well, right oh my on. goodness. Ah. Uh, well, it was uh. I think the most important thing is learning to build a cabin and just living off the fat of the land. Like, uh, like Lenny and George. Yeah, I can't do that because my cholesterol is high, so I'm less fat. Oh, <laughs> man. That's the, land, that's the land of milk and honey, man. Yeah. How do you get, how it, how do you get oh, high cholesterol? <laughs> How, um, how does how does your cholesterol get high? Are you body shaming me? <laughs> okay, that's fucked up. No, I'm asking like 
as someone who's bigger diet. in health. Just depends on what you eat. Um, a lot of it's just to do with diet. I thought it had to do with like how your body processed things. I was trying to actually ask like for a like biology lesson here, but that's cool if you want to like go to body shaming, whatever. I get it. I don't get it actually, but whatever. Calm down. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I don't. I mean, I don't really know. I just got a blood test done last month. Yeah, last month. And they told me my cholesterol hot is high. I think my cholesterol was high. Something like that. Something was high. And I got to eat like less red meat. Oh, More so fit. it's, a red, it's a red meat thing? It can be. That's why, that's why I found out. They didn't tell me to eat less red meat. They just said, you know, try to get your cholesterol down through means through the means of a diet, changing up your diet. Or if it doesn't work, you got to go on medication. Okay. My questions are genuine. I am the worst when it comes to health. Like I think that I'm doing things right, but I actually don't have any clue. I don't track it or whatever. Everything starts with the gut. Good. So out of what you eat goes into what you're into your health, right, Brandon? That's what they say. It's like the second brain or something like that. Yeah, because a lot Who of the things that? a lot of people heard people say the gut. <laughs> Second brain. Like diet plays a huge part in life. That's why the state no, of for sure. is the way it is because with the bullshit we put into our bodies and all the processed crap that goes into us. But a lot of it is just, um, uh, not, I mean, it's better to have a varied diet. Uh, I don't really have a varied diet, so I need more vegetables and fruits and stuff like that and not just meats, mm -hmm. less red meat. I mean, you can probably, uh, Brandon, you could probably ask Chris about that because I know he stopped eating red meat. I don't know if he still stopped that, but for a long time he wasn't eating red meat. Um, yeah, he didn't do any tests, so he wouldn't know. Um, right, but he, he did it anyway because he, I mean, he probably, I think he probably looked about, like, looked up how that works. Well, it was a lot of moral reasons. He didn't like yeah. factory farming, and I agree with that. Right, and that's, I mean, that's uh, as good an excuse as anything to, like, do it because, I mean, there's a lot of mm -hmm. lot of um, vegetarian and like vegan things even or more I don't know plant based diets that really have issue find issue with red meat and just because of the, just because I don't know the exact reasoning for it just because of what is like the nutrients or whatever is in red meat caught, like if you eat, eat it too regularly there's it becomes an issue. Yeah, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's the meat, but just bad food. Yeah, yeah maybe what's in the like what's what how the meat is raised and all that stuff and processed. Yeah, I, I mean I, I can I processing. I can speak to being a vegetarian because I was one for thirteen years. I mean I can I yeah. can attest to like things that make you feel good or don't feel good based off of my own personal diet. But I, I don't know what they actually did to like, that's why I was inquiring. I, I don't know what they did to my cholesterol or my sugar, whatever. I um, like one of the biggest things for me, honestly, is water intake. So I was a vegetarian for about 13 years and I, I learned because I ended up with like kidney stones and I don't wish that upon anyone. Um, but like one of the, the biggest things is, is water intake. So I've been really, really bad about water intake for a long, long time. And I learned not too long ago um, that a big part of, of being bad about that is if you're a vegetarian and you and you get a lot of your nutrients from fruit and vegetables like it can confuse your body into thinking it's not thirsty and so i went days i went weeks without like having more than a glass of water because i never felt thirsty i never felt thirsty and i ended up with kidney stones and kidney issues um 
for a good portion of my life because of that. Um, not, not hydrating properly is the only thing that I'm very aware of (laughs) when it comes to health issues. So yeah, that's why, that's why I was asking about cholesterol because I, I don't, I deal so much with uh, issues of dehydration that I don't really know that much about anything else. Um, but yeah, like be very careful if you are a vegan or a vegetarian and um, because your body is fooled into thinking it's not thirsty because of all the water that is intrinsic in your fruits and vegetables. So drink measure that shit <laughs> i have to though or i'm screwed right. it's like right. instantly and like two days go by and i it, i don't drink enough water i'm in horrible pain so yeah be careful about that i think you can only go three days without what what was that i think you can only go three days without water i thought it was like seven Probably right. <laughs> I don't know. No, that's food. I think you can. Well, somebody like can weigh days. in. Three to four days. Three no, to four no, days. No, Did you just water. Google that? Like any yeah. kind of water. Wait, without food for three weeks, uh, but only last three to four days without water. Yep, but that's yep. to assume. That's to assume that. The water isn't in anything you eat, correct? Right. True. Out True. Any water you, at all. Obviously, you didn't die. You're okay now. No, you but that makes it. perfect sense. I was going days with drinking maybe a glass of water a day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Be careful if you're going to be environmentally conscious and be vegan or vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, still got. There's things. Water. Yeah, there's things you don't. Well, you, I mean, you just don't. You don't get those sensors. You don't realize. I mean, when you're thirsty, you drink. Like, it's not like you're like, oh, I'm thirsty and I'm not going to drink water. (laughs) It's, you know, those sensors don't go off when you're getting enough water. Yeah. On the massage massage therapist side. Uh, it basically starves your cells and they can't function correctly if they don't have what they need to survive. So, or just like do what they're supposed to do, like in the, so and, their processes can continue and flush the bad stuff out basically. Right. Every, you know, you need a cycle. So I swore to myself, I wasn't going to allow us to do like a two hour podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I knew, I knew that, I knew that the three, it's, it's so bittersweet, you guys. I knew that the three of us, like, together, that would be, like, an impossible task. Like, I love being with both of you right now, and it's, like I said, it's bittersweet, because I, the last time, the last time we were all together, what was it, like, your, your dad's, your dad's birthday, Brandon, is 50th, right? Yeah. I think, not his 50th, but. Was it 60? was it 60 yeah. uh i'm not sure no what yeah. you can't remember it just happened he was born in 59 figure it out you figure <laughs> it out it's your dad yeah everyone has one you know he's gonna <laughs> listen to this and be like cool i'm glad my son doesn't know anything about my age Awesome. Exactly his birthday. We just <laughs> talked about it. I love my dad very much. <laughs> we all love your dad very much. He's amazing. He's so he's kind of been all of our dads. <laughs> yeah, true. True. He's um yep. he definitely knows when to give you advice and stuff like that. I'm gonna get emotional if we start talking about your dad, so we should probably change the subject. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we should probably wrap up pretty soon. <laughs> Definitely okay, think. I have summation points. Go you have it. what? I have summation points. Okay. Let's for your audience. It. Okay. Let's 
So when it comes to sustainability, for people who care, (laughs) which should be everyone, number one, don't try to be a sustainability expert in one day. Two, educate yourself. Work to understand. Try to understand global issues. Um, Not one solution fits all. Consume less and and waste less and try to think about what happens to things at their quote unquote end of life can you reuse them should you recycle them and then you know again humans are the one things on the planet that take 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 so if you're thinking about how you can give back that is a very responsible mentality. Um, yeah, those are those are some things that I want people to focus on instead of trying to think of how they can solve all sustainability environmental problems at once. I think those are good starting points. Critical thinking is essential. So just understand that the best quote unquote solutions vary geographically and over time. So. You can do it. So, yeah, the future yeah. doctor, the future doctor, like <laughs> the summer. Um, when um, you say you've published some papers, um, have they been in journals? Yeah, I have a paper published in the Journal of Waste Management. Okay. It's one of my most proud papers. Um, so. There's a thing out there's a there's like the knowledge out there that some people are aware of um, about uh, like reading papers. Like if they buy these journals, the majority of the money goes to the publishers, and not to the scientists or the doctors who are writing it. Um, they, a lot of people say if you want to read someone's paper to just like get a hold of the publisher or the author directly. Is that something you agree with or would you rather them just buy the journal to read it? Um, I guess it depends on you know, what your aim is, like what you're trying to gain. So like if you, if you come across the paper um, that you think will be beneficial to educating you on a certain topic, you could definitely reach out to the author. I was going to say that um, if anybody has specific, like, Um, I had talked to Andrew about this before, like I didn't want to get too technical throughout this podcast because I didn't want to overwhelm the audience and I wanted to talk about sustainability in a tangible way. But if people want to talk about things that are specific, if they have specific questions, um, I will, you know, be happy to answer that. Reach out to Brandon or Andrew for my information. They can direct you to me if you have specific sustainability questions and if I can't answer them I can direct you to someone else or a resource that can educate you further on that topic um I'm I love getting people in touch with other people and and resources that can help them better understand things so um you know don't like I would say that most people that care about this topic would be happy to have these conversations with you. So do your own research so that you have specific questions and, and, you know, you can reach out to these authors and they will, they will respond to you. Um, So I think I don't, I don't want to encourage anyone to just like randomly be like, Hey, tell me all about this topic. And, you know, a lot of these researchers, researchers have a lot of things going on that they're working on but if you have a specific question i will bet money that they will answer you so do your own research have critical thinking in mind and ask educated educated questions and people will respond to you and they will have conversations with you um they just want to know that you care enough to do your own research um but i i will definitely happily be a resource for anyone who wants to find more resources or people to talk to about specific 
specific things. So, um, yeah. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, cool, and cool, if cool. you want to uh, reach out to us, uh, we, you can find us on Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash diametric convergence. Um, we're on Twitter. Uh, what are we on Twitter as, Brandon? Diametric con and then uh, diametric convergence at gmail.com. Yep, so there's multiple ways and to reach out to us you. for sure. Sorry. For sure. Absolutely. Next week, we will have Carol Chin, and we'll be talking about basically preventing the dissolving healthcare system. Ooh, excited for that one. Yeah, so stick around for that. That'll be coming yeah. up next. Um, yeah. Thank yeah. you for joining us today. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Leslie, for joining us very much. I know you're a wealth of knowledge, and we'll definitely get into some deeper topics as we go on with this podcast so hopefully you'll come join us again and um it was a pleasure having you as always thanks guys i really appreciate you having me and yeah of course reach out anytime i love you guys so much all right awesome thank you bye